As many of you may have heard, several years ago, the Luce Foundation um, became concerned with the lack of attention in international affairs programs like the School of International Public Affairs here at Columbia to issues of religion. Um, and they had done a fair amount of serious work looking at higher education in the United States and how religion was considered and how it was organized, the study of religion was organized in <coughs> universities. Um, and they concluded that one of the things that they thought ought to be strengthened was thinking about religion not simply in religion departments or in divinity schools, but more broadly in a community of people who care about public policy. So they issued a request for proposals from a number of institutions around the United States um, suggesting that they would support creative, innovative ways of thinking about religion and public policy, particularly in the context of international and global issues. Um, they ultimately supported three such programs, and one of them is ours. And this is the, one of the very first of what will be a program of several years um, of development of new courses, of seminar series, of faculty programs, and public programs and outreach like this afternoon's. Our particular emphasis in our program is not only to bring across the university perspectives from different departments, different schools, um, to really create a context and a community of people who are interested in debating the questions that will be, I think, Luce was right, preoccupying us for the most of the 21st century about how religion ought to be understood in public policy terms. But we also said that we wanted to focus particularly on democracy and the dilemmas that democracy poses for religious traditions and the dilemmas that religious traditions often pose in democratic societies. Part of our comparative advantage in doing that um, is actually the presence on our campus of Alfred Steffen, who is the leader of our loose project for the next few years and the director of our um, center on that's grown out of our loose project. So before I do anything else, I want to thank um, Professor Steppen for his work on helping us conceptualize what we want to do, what we think our comparative advantage is, how we think comparatively across um, religious traditions, across countries, across democratic experiments, um, and for providing a lot of the intellectual energy and excitement about what I think is going to be a really genuinely innovative set of programs here at Columbia. Um, he's aided by a number of people, uh, too numerous to mention here, but it's not just Al, it's mostly Al. <laughs> um, so again, I want to thank him and um, I look forward to what will be a couple of years of meetings like this and other kinds of things. And if you're interested in this sort of issue broadly, um, know that this is going to be something which we will be doing um, in a variety of ways and would welcome ideas and involvement and enthusiasm um, from our Columbia-based community. But today, we're really gathered here um, to hear one of the most interesting political figures in the world, really, um, on these kinds of issues about the relationship between religion and democracy. Um, Amin Rice is actually fairly well known to us in the academic community in the United States, although that's not what his real claim to fame is, the fact that he has a PhD from the University of Chicago um, and has traveled in the academic circles in the United States um, for a long time. He, that's something we're proud of and we're proud of the the contribution that the American higher education has made to his career, but in fact, as you undoubtedly know, he is a significant political figure in his home country of Indonesia and led the People's Consultative Assembly um, between 1999 and 2004, um, leading, and is really one of the most important figures in Indonesia promoting good governance and democracy. Um, at the head of the Consultative Assembly, he presided over um, 
four phases, the four phases of the constitutional reforms to in the Indian, in, in Indonesian constitution. Um, and if you're not careful, he and Al Steppen will go through that constitution article by article <laughs> um, for you. So um, it's really, it, he is also obviously, uh, or perhaps not obviously, but well known, I think to most people, an activist in the Muhammadiyah movement in Indonesia and is the chairman of the Muhammadiyah Central Board, was the chairman during the late 1990s. Um, a wide range of experience leading social organizations, academic organizations. In addition to all of this, he is um, a dean of a faculty of political science at a university in um, Jakarta and is a very active member of the communities, not only religious, political, intellectual, um, the worlds that we are interested in. And so we are enormously fortunate to be able to have him here um, and have him be willing to talk to us a little bit about the perspectives he brings to the sorts of issues that we are going to be looking at for the next few years. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Anderson, um, who's, of course, is not only dean of the school, but a dean of Middle Eastern studies, Islamic studies uh, in the United States. And uh, now, our guest today is a quadruple leader uh, in Indonesia and has done absolutely everything I teach. Uh, so it is a great honor uh, having him here and as our first speaker in this program. Um, he, as, he's a religious leader, and he was the elected chairman of Muhammadiyah, which is the world's second largest Muslim organization with approximately 28 million members. Uh, for, and he was the elected leader from 1991 to 1995. Uh, he's also a major civil society leader. Uh, in that he both helped mobilize, but helped democratically and peacefully focus the major protests in the street uh, against Suharto's rule, which was from 1966, to, and it ends in 20 May 1998, peacefully. A lot of the reason both he fell and it was peaceful was how Amin Rice mobilized the student uh, organizations. And it was marvelous because he was a religious leader, but he understood that uh, to really make a powerful organization and mobilization like this, you have to really reach out and be able to communicate with secular people, uh, religious leaders, uh, and create a new common goal. And that's what he did. And, and that was brilliant. And the common goal was to create democracy uh, in Indonesia. Uh, I arrived uh, about a week or so after that. I was invited to meet with a number of people about possible alternative futures in democracy. But again and again, your colleagues uh, would, could not help but, as an aside, saying those were great days. And you missed the great days, and he was crucial. Uh, and that he was able to make this happen and mobilize it. So he's, he's a major independent leader of civil society as such. Then. Uh, in my courses, introductory courses, I always talk about political society. Now, not enough of us in civil society really care enough about political society. He did. Uh, he was elected the leader of what was the Constituent Assembly. And he did it from 1999 to 2004. And this was not easy. Uh, we were just chatting, and we chatted yesterday. Uh, the center of Indonesia uh, has many very tolerant people of all different stripes. But as most societies, there are many extremists in different places, and the things could have gotten well out of control. Uh, and, but what they wrote, uh, he was very important in the rewriting of the Constitution. And in my judgment, uh, I don't know if he quite agrees, and we had, uh, we'll talk about it more. Uh, they've arrived at, they reaffirmed, but broadened uh, their traditional formula towards religions, uh, which is somewhat close to India's. And those equal, it's not American type of total wall of separation. Uh, it is rather like India's, which is equal respect and equal support and equal distance from all religions, keeping equal respect. So one of the things he did was that you had this horrible slaughter against Chinese in 1965. He made sure that Pankasia, for the first time ever, incorporated Confucianism. So all the, all the major religions in Indonesia are a part of this equal respect 
equal tolerance, equal support. And that was one of the, uh, so he won, I mean, he, he presided over the conversations that both reaffirmed that but deepened it and broadened it and gave overall uh, a whole series of horizontal and vertical constraints on the office of the president that had been absolutely uh, non-existent uh, in the sense independent. And this was, he recognized and the Constituent Assembly recognized that this was an important task. Um, so, uh, where, do, where does this leave us? It, well, he knows that there's all sorts of things to do. He would, uh, the military remains one of the most self-financing militaries in the world. Uh, and therefore, the control of the purse strings, that's a crucial part of any democratic accountability, is at the moment something you have to work for uh, and achieve. And he knows that they haven't achieved many things. I mean, that, that there are many more things to achieve. But if we take a look at Ted Gura's ranking, probably the most prestigious ranking of uh, uh, democracies in the world, it's a 20 point index. Of the 45 Muslim majority countries in the world, uh, two. Uh, on a 20-point index have a score of 18. Uh, that in the two highest are Indonesia uh, and Senegal. Uh, that would have not have happened, uh, and they would not get to 20 if it wasn't uh, for Amin Rice. Amin Rice, welcome to Columbia University. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have a very great honor to be invited to give lecture to, to you. And I'm afraid that what I'm going to tell you has been uh, described in a nutshell by Professor Stephen. So basically, my lecture is through. Yeah. <laughs> and we can just <laughs> uh, start by key and a, but uh, let me let me start off by reminding you that Indonesia is the biggest Muslim country and the territory is also very wide. The distance from the most extreme to the eastern, easternmost uh, part of Indonesia to the most, to the, to, to the extreme western part of Indonesia from Maroke to to Sabang is about uh, the distance from Jeddah in Saudi Arabia to Paris in France. And we have three time zones. This is just to remind you in case you do not know how big Indonesia is. And then we have a big population, 220 million people. We have six official religions, Islam, uh, Catholicism, uh, Protestantism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and in the reform era, uh, my government uh, recognized another official religion, which is Confucianism. And then we have around 250 ethnic groups with they own respective lingua franca. And that's why our national symbol is Pineka Tunggal Ika, unity in diversity. You know, Indonesia is, relatively uh, speaking, a young nation. We proclaim our independence in 1945. And we learned democracy since we got our independence from the Dutch. And I can tell you that Indonesian people have experienced four kinds of democracies. The first one is what we call liberal and parliamentary democracy between 1945 till 1955. But as a really independent nation, I think uh, I could say that we enjoy the full independence and sovereignty uh, only in 1950, because in 1957 and 1959, our former uh, colonizer tried to come back to, to colonize again Indonesia, but 
fortunately we could just uh, drove them back to Holland. And then in 1955, the first time for Indonesian people to hold free, transparent, and a fair general election. From that on, I believe that Indonesian people tried to implement democracy while, of course, we, are still, we were still learning uh, the ABC of democracy. And then it was very interesting to remember that during the parliamentary democracy, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the edge of, uh, of, of its cabinet was so short. Sometimes it was only six months, nine months, and then there is a majority uh, veto from, uh, on the part of the parliament, and then the, 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 the government collapsed. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you, which is related to my theme, is that in 1955, we had a special election to form our constituent assembly, what we call it the uh, one constituante. In that constituent assembly, there was a fiery debate between the three groups, the Muslims, the nationalists, and the communists. As you know, the communists in Indonesia is the biggest uh, group uh, outside the socialist camp. So the Indonesian Communist Party was the biggest in the, in, 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 I mean, outside the socialist camp. Uh, that, that's why the political influence and then the the political impact of the communists uh, were very great at the time. And then there were three split uh, political uh, ambition or aspiration. The Muslims at the time wanted to have Sharia state for Indonesia. And then the nationalists uh, want to cling to just keep Pancasila as our state ideology and state philosophy while those communists wanted to make Marxism-Leninism as the basis of Indonesia, of, of Indonesian state. But from 1955 to 1959, the debate finally came to a stalemate, and on ni on Ju in July 1959, our first president, Mr. President Suharto, made a political decree, namely the Indonesian people had to return to the original constitution, uh, i.e. the 1945 Constitution. So, in a way, I think the Indonesian people uh, failed to implement parliamentary democracy, and Mr. Sukarno introduced a new kind of democracy, which he called guided democracy. But, and then we uh, felt at that time it is more guidance than <laughs> democracy itself. You know? I mean, I mean, Mr. Sukarno became the great leader of Indonesia, and then uh, his personal statement became a kind of law. Uh, and there is a cult of individual at that time, and everybody has to, uh, what you call it, to, 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 to install his picture and maybe what happened in Iraq during the Saddam Hussein uh, happened to my country. I mean, the number of Sukarno's pictures uh, were more than the Indonesian people. I mean, <laughs> hundreds of millions uh, everywhere that we have to, 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 to install uh, his picture in the market, in the universities, in, in the countryside. I mean, every single family has, to, has his picture. But, and then, uh, as you know, the guided democracy finally came into a fiasco, and uh, the communist coup d'etat in 1965 uh, ended the trial uh, <laughs> and error of guided democracy. And from then on, Mr. Suharto introduced a still new kind of democracy, which he calls Pancasila democracy. He defined his democracy by saying that Pancasila democracy is a democracy 
which does not recognize demonstration and opposition. I think this very, very strange democracy. Uh, uh, but of course, because Indonesian people are so dutiful, obedient, and and easy to be domesticated, uh, nobody uh, challenged him. You know? uh, I was challenging him when I came back from Chicago because uh, Chicago was responsible, of course, in 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 making me uh, have moral courage to, to challenge Mr. Suharto. You know? But it's another story. Uh, so, so um, Mr. Suharto, uh, I believe, suffered from what I call Louis the Fourteenth syndrome, Leta Semoa. You know? uh, when you criticize uh, him, uh, he got so mad because uh, he interpreted that you criticize the nation, the country. Uh, Suharto and his family became so sacred, mass, not, not a single mass media dare to criticize uh, Mr. Suharto, and his family become, become the holy, the sacred, the sacred song family in, in, in the nation. Uh, but as you know, uh, when Suharto became our president, uh, the development was there. I, I have to be very very honest that not all these achievements were negative and destructive, but there are many uh, achievements uh, done by Mr. Suharto, especially in terms of economic and uh, especially in economic and maybe social development. Uh, Indonesia once became one of the Asian tigers uh, besides China, Taiwan, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, and South Korea. Uh, it was Mr. Suharto uh, who I think uh, had the credit to, to, to develop uh, our country. And then he was assisted by what we call in Asia Berkeley Mafia. I mean, those economists. Uh, educated in Berkeley, when they came back to Indonesia, they became finance minister, the president of the central bank, minister of trade, and other minister related to the uh, economic and, 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 and trade and commercial uh, dimensions in my country. But the thing which Indonesian people finally cannot afford to let Suharto become president was that over time, Mr. Suharto finally became a kind of Japanese king. A uh, typical Japanese king is a leader who did not tolerate any criticism, and then uh, he tried to aggrandize uh, the economic imperium of his family. And then uh, his government was suffering from what we call corruption, collusion, and nepotism. But uh, it, it was very interesting to remember that Mr. Harto could stay in power for almost 32 years. That's why when I launched my idea to have succession of the national leadership, people were so stunned, or surprised at least, that uh, an intellectual just came back from Chicago, suddenly make a stupid <laughs> and crazy and insane idea, i.e. To, to appeal to the nation that enough is enough, Mr. Suharto must step down because uh, democracy uh, needs a rotation of power. Democracy uh, uh, has to respect the opinion of the people. And uh, Mr. Suharto was about time uh, to step down in, 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 uh, in, in late 1990s.
ladies and gentlemen, when I watch the documentary film uh, about the process of reforms, and I saw in that film my uh, significant role in toppling him, uh, I talk to myself, you know, whether I still have courage to repeat that kind of of political brief and political, I don't know what, what to say, but, but, but uh, it was very, very, I mean, very electrifying for me. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, the opposition uh, on the part of the new order to my idea was so great even at the time, I just wanted to withdraw from from uh, my selling the idea of succession. In. But uh, thank God that the my idea has finally prevailed on campuses, uh, even uh, in the community at large. You know, and to shorten the story. Uh, Mr. Suharto finally stepped down in, on May, May 20, 1998. And then from then on, the process of reforms uh, uh, has, been going, has been going on up to now. Uh, and I could tell you that the most difficult problem for the whole nation namely whether we have to stick to Pancasila as our irrefugable uh, philosophy and ideology, or we can accept Sharia style, Sharia government, Sharia state to our country. During the process of amending the Constitution, I had a very interesting experience that on that day when we want to just just uh, lock uh, that Pancasila can never ever be changed anymore, two Islamic political parties came to my office and then they said, Mr. Chairman, let me tell you that we don't want to shake the country by still proposing the change of Article 29 of the Constitution. Article 29 said, Indonesia is a country based on one and only God. I, th I think the Hinduists, the Buddhists, the Christians, the Muslims, can accept this uh, this article, but there are political groups, certain groups in my country, which want to change that article into a new one, which says Indonesia is based on Sharia Islam, Islamic Sharia, with the obligation that every single Muslim has to implement has to practice his or her Islamic teachings. But the two political parties came to me. They said they didn't want to have a voting because they will be outvoted. So please, Mr. Chairman, save our face. Don't uh, give the chance uh, to, I mean, to, 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 to make a voting in the plenary meeting of the People's Assembly. And then I said, if you know that you will be outfitted, why did you always talk to the mass media that you wanted to change the article? Then he said this, you understand, Mr. Chairman, the reason why we keep telling the people that we wanted to change the article into the Islamic Sharia state because it is for the consumption for our constituency. Because if we don't talk what we said, our constituent will just 
uh, leave us, and then we will be uh, forgotten. You know. So I can tell you, Mr. Ladies and gentlemen, that the problem of Sharia state in my country is just done, especially because Muhammadiyah and NU, the two biggest and giant Islamic organizations, have the same idea that it is very dangerous, it could be divisive, it can crack the whole nation if the issue of Sharia is discussed again, or even if there are some political groups in my country wanted to transform Pantasra state into Sharia state. So I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that, that this difficult uh, and dilemmatic problem has been over in my country. And now we have been trying to implement another new kind of democracy, which we call plain democracy. Democracy without any adjective, without, without any qualification. But I'm afraid after seven and a half years trying to implement democracy, so far the, the democracy has not delivered, uh, I mean, what we expect. For example, we are very proud because Indonesia suddenly become one of the greatest democracies in the world. Uh, but actually, the day-to-day -day life of Indonesian people are still quite miserable. Of course, through the, through the ideas of reform, uh, we have given decentralization to the provinces and regions. Of course, we have to change the dual function of the military into, 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 I mean, into, into, into a new shape, you know. I mean, that, that, that we have written the military and the police to the, their barracks. I mean, they, they don't have any dual function any longer. And, of course, we enjoy freedom of the press. And then there is no uh, political prisoners, either from what they, what, what we call, uh, years ago, extreme left and extreme right, you know. Uh, I, I mean, there are, now we are enjoying many, many uh, democratic values, but day-to-day -day life of the majority of the people, unfortunately, are still miserable. In other words, to the rank and file, to the people uh, in the streets, you know, the common people, democracy so far has not delivered. Even in my country, unemployment, instead of uh, decreasing, uh, it is now increasing. And then the twin sister of unemployment, poverty, is also widening. Uh, and then the future of Indonesia is not that bright. Uh, the illegal logging, the corruption is still very wide indeed, very prevailing. Indonesia belongs to the most corrupt nations. I think we are number five or number six. Uh, we failed to get championship in the football, in badminton, in tennis, but at least we have uh, achieved the championship in corruption, you know. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, uh, I have been following very closely the process of reforms in my country, and then even I was uh, very proud when uh, the students in my country uh, installed me as the father of reform, something like that, you know. But the problem is that something 
which is very important, is missing in my country. Indonesia is a paradox. Indonesia is a very rich in terms of natural resources, but the people are poverty stricken. Indonesia is big and huge and very rich, but the achievement, I mean the Human Development Index and then the achievement of education and things like this, you know, are so low. I have been contemplating what is the crux of the problem. To me, the crux of the problem is that my nation, including its leaders, have lost the confidence in managing our own natural resources. Especially because we are living in the uh, first decade of the 21st century, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there is a phenomenon called corporatocracy. And in Indonesia, instead of, of trying to survive and facing the corporatocracy, Indonesia voluntarily make itself become a part and parcel of the corporatocracy. What I mean by corporatocracy is that now there is a political, diplomatic, military, financial, economic giant which controls the world. And the corporatocracy to me consists of at least six components. The first one is big corporations like Exxon Mobil, Chevron, uh, uh, Newman, Freeport McMoran, and etc. etc. Of course, the big corporations, 24 hours around the clock, has one single obsession, i.e., how to make maximal profit through any means, legal, if possible, and if, uh, if uh, I mean, if, if it is possible, and illegal if necessary. But of course, this big corporation cannot make a cake walk or something like that uh, without the second element, uh, which is, I believe, I'm sorry to say this very frankly, the Western governments. I mean, there is, there is a political backup uh, which spot the the goals of, 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 of the big corporation. And then the economic and political marriage is not enough without the military uh, uh, interest, which is also uh, get married with the two previous elements. Just look at the uh, Iraq or any other uh, countries. Uh, usually, the three, the trio, trio components uh, are very successful in 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 in, in controlling uh, a, a, a third, uh, I mean a, a, a developing country, for example, uh, in quote unquote plundering the resources. Uh, and then the the, the 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 fourth component, to me, is the mass media, because without mass media, uh, the three previous components or elements uh, cannot achieve their goal uh, easily. But the mass media, I believe, uh, try to cultivate and to change necessarily the mind of the people that big corporations are nice thing, that globalization are good for everybody, something like that, you know. And then there are fifth component, I believe the academician who become intellectual prostitute to, to, to strengthen uh, the big corporations. And last but not least, the sixth component is the national elite of a country which facilitates 
the process of uh, of controlling, of dominating, even sometimes plundering the resources. Now, it is very unfortunate that Indonesia, I believe, belong to the countries which are so easily to be domesticated and to be controlled by the huge corporatic uh, uh, corporatocracy. Ladies and gentlemen, as an as Indonesian citizen, as an Indonesian son, I have come to an, a conclusion that Indonesia will never ever achieve prosperity until Indonesian people have the courage, have the willingness, have the, uh, I don't know how to say, have the, the solid will you know, to manage our own resources uh, for the sake of our own people and I know and I'm aware that it is just impossible Indonesia can manage by herself without the help of the external external sites. You know. I don't want to say foreign because sometimes I was reminded by, by my friend, please, I mean, don't to mention foreign too much, you can be accused as a xenophobic, xenophobic person. You know. uh, so, so instead of using foreign, I, I, I use external, external sites, external corporation, external uh, units, something like that. You know. Now, give me uh, some examples. You know. The biggest gold mining in the globe happened to be in Papua. Freeport McMoran have 100% uh, what do you call it? It's a technical term. Uh, op operatorship uh, in taking the gold, the copper, the silver uh, concentrate. And for your information, the second work contract, which was signed by both sides, by my country and McMoran, uh, was, I mean, I mean the, the contract uh, will, will take place until 50 years of half century. Until the year 241, it was signed in 1991, so until the year 241, Freeport McMoran can do whatever it wishes, you know, to, to take uh, our gold, our copper, our maybe uranium, you know, without the monitoring, the supervision of both the local government and the central government. I think this is only one example. If you go to Natuna, ExxonMobil Exxon Mobil has been given a blank check, so to speak, to operate, to take out, to, to take our gas unlimited. The operatorship was given to ExxonMobil and then through the submarine pipe, the gas uh, come out in the Singaporean territory, and then it is the government of Singapore who sells our gas, and then every, every, uh, uh, every year, the ExxonMobil will tell my government, we have taken your gas, so and so, uh, 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 such and such amount, and then this is your part. If you want to take it, we thank you, if you don't, even we thank you more. I mean, I mean, this is, I mean, 
uh, irrational to me. You know. That's why Muslim people have accepted democracy wholeheartedly, except some small fundamentalist, extremist, radicalist. Uh, they said that democracy is a cultural imperialism of the West, but I don't buy this uh, stupid uh, comment, you know. But the problem now, which we are facing, is that we have implemented democracy seriously, but people in the street now starting to ask what is the advantage, what is the benefit of having democracy. That's why some people, especially in the countryside, you know, are nostalgic about the Suharto era. They said when Suharto was president, our life was much better. You know. But not because of the reforms, we are so miserable. And Amir Rais is one of the reform figures, so he must be held responsible. You know. So I just don't want to, to hear that kind of, of, <laughs> of negative uh, comment. You know. So, ladies and gentlemen, sometime I made an analogy that Indonesian people are still in a long tunnel and there is no light yet at the end of the long tunnel. So, the darkness is still uh, blanketed us, you know. Uh, th that's why. Uh, Years, I mean, one or two years from now would be very decisive. Uh, some military generals now have said again and again that they wanted to eliminate, to abolish the four states amendment because they said the original constitution was much better, was perfect, was sacred, why did the assembly uh, dare to amend the constitution? So, so you, you can imagine that there is uh, political forces within Indonesia who wanted to turn the clock of history to the past. And uh, to be very honest, I envy uh, Malaysia with its Mahathir, Hugo Chavez, I am not very, very really, I mean, Hugo Chavez is good, but he is too arrogant. Yeah. Uh, I think Indonesian, for Indonesian, Indonesian, uh, Indonesian criteria, Hugo Chavez uh, is good, but also bad because it is, he is too arrogant. You know. But people like Mahathir, even Taksin, even uh, Erdogan from Turkey, and many, many other leaders who can survive, uh, who can uh, bring their respective nation in the wave of globalization quite safely, I think are examples, good examples for my country. Indonesia, I think now it's at the crossroad, you know, whether we can regain our self-confidence and then we make uh, the big corporations as partners, not our bosses or masters, you know, uh, or we will continue this situation uh, with the risk that we damage the uh, interests of our nation. We do this service to our nation by not having moral and political courage to say enough is enough to the big corporations uh, which just, uh, again, quote unquote, plundered our resources. You know. So, ladies and gentlemen, just pray for Indonesia that the democracy will finally settle and will deliver uh, its promises because if it is not, and then the 
old political forces, who knows, will come back to the stage. You know. Especially, I remember very well what is said by Marx, that nobody will relinquish his power voluntarily. I mean, those who were brought down uh, by the process of rebounds are, are really out, but they still exist. You know, and they, they are still very uh, strong and very well organized to, to come back to the national stage. You know. So in conclusion, before we take question and answer, or I will to make uh, comments from you, uh, I would say that Indonesian people now again at the crossroad, and it depends on the leaders, especially whether they will change, they are committed to change the status quo into a better perspective, or they just continue because they have arrived, they become arrivé, and they have so uh, contented, so complacent, com complacent, and then, of course, if they take the second alternative, the future of a democracy in my country is quite gloomy. But, of course, uh, my region told me, told the Muslims, that uh, despondence is the sign of a kafir. Uh, so we have to be very optimistic uh, uh, in seeing our future with hard working, with togetherness, and with optimism. Thank you. Um, thank you very, very much. And uh, also thank you for being willing to receive questions of any sort. Uh, Jose Casanova, one of the major theoreticians in the world on uh, public religions. Society today, in the scheme of things, what these challenges, uh, socioeconomic development, my question is perhaps not as relevant, but nonetheless it is important for the issue of religion and tolerance and democracy and the issue of unity and diversity. I think that it's important to emphasize how positive the system of official recognition of multiple religions is, and uh, how commendable it is that this has been expanded to Confucians. My question has to do with the unintended consequences of the system that those religions which are not officially recognized do not have then equal respect with the others. And particularly it has to do with the indigenous religions or the opportunity, the possibility of expanding the system of recognition to indigenous religion, so far as there is a pressure for indigenous people to basically convert to one of the official religions, Christianity in some, and this, as we know, is one of the factors for the conflicts, Christian Muslim conflicts. So uh, uh, my question is, has there been any thought of expanding the recognition of diversity to the indigenous people in their religion? Yeah. Sir, so, as far as I know, besides the six of the religions, Asian people may have their own faith, uh, their private personal faith. Uh, that's why if you go to the countryside, there are many people who every Thursday morning burn the, what call it, a special, uh, I don't call, I, I don't recall the, the English term, you know, for, I mean something when it is burned, it smells very strange. Incense. Incense, yeah. It's incense, you know. Uh, they, they can still go to, to, to anywhere they wish, you know. So, so uh, the beautiful development in this regard is that not only does the government recognize the six official religions, but anybody, practically speaking, can have his or her own private faith. You know. So, so we have expanded that, 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 that tolerance, so to speak. I'm sorry. To go back to Sharia, which you have commented a little bit, um, actually, in Aceh, Sharia is alive as well. Now, I actually, um, and regardless of the special autonomy status that uh, Aceh has, doesn't actually 
the fact that Sharia isn't being implemented in Aceh is against the secular foundation of Indonesia. And you can sort of elaborate on the paradox. Yeah. Yeah, this is really a uh, kind of difficult situation. The problem is that Aceh has been given special autonomy. And then the Aceh leaders, the Aceh ulama, uh, have implemented the Sharia law. But when they implemented the Sharia law, Indonesian people, Indonesian government, even I'm a, 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 a good Muslim, I believe, yeah. I, I was so shocked uh, because the Aceh, regardless, I, I mean, I still respect my uh, Acehnese brothers and sisters, you know, because in the presidential election, I won a uh, landslide in that province, you know. <laughs> I, I got 17 million voters when I joined the presidential election, and I won in in uh, West Sumatra, Aceh, and in my own province of Jakarta. You know. At least uh, I was accepted by my own surrounding. You know. uh, back to Aceh, uh, for example, I think 90% of Indonesian people were stunned when seeing the uh, implementation of Sharia in punishing some gamblers. You know. Maybe you, you, you see in the internet or in the Temple magazine, those gamblers were brought to the, to, the, to, to, to the mosque on Friday afternoon, and then the, what do you call it? The, what is it? Caning. Yeah, the caning, yeah. The caning were witnessed by hundreds of the Muslim people who just finished their Friday prayers, you know. And then the ulama in Jakarta, ulama from Enura Muhammadiyah, said that, uh, does Islam really mean that kind of punishment, you know? I mean punishment is educative, there is an educative aspect in punishing a criminal or even a gambler, you know, but by exposing the punishment and then the children, the wives, the the, the, the neighbors of, of, of the gamblers uh, were so uh, sad and so 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 so, so disheartened. And I, I mean, this kind of Sharia implementation, I think, is not right. You know, uh, but the problem is that we have given a Czech government to have full Sharia law, and they now have been implementing the Sharia law. So I think this is a dilemma in my country that we have a Panther state, we don't uh, make Indonesia as an Islamic state or Sharia state, but a part of Indonesia, because of the special autonomy, practice the, I mean the, the middle, uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I mean, uh, the, the law which was practiced uh, by Aceh law, uh, Aceh court, I think is beyond the expectation of, of the of the Muslim people in my country. So, so we, we just want to 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 wait what kind of uh, the, what kind of a future Aceh will have by having split autonomy and uh, by having Sharia law, which is implemented literally like uh, what happened in the Middle Ages. You know. I'll say a word on this because we chatted a long time about it yesterday. And, uh, this is a form of decentralization like called federacy. Uh, uh, Greenland has this in relationship to Denmark. But the, the misunderstanding, and, and I think it, it needs more debate, uh, no form of decentralization in a democracy implies, and, and unfortunately some people think it does at the moment, but no form of decentralization in a democracy implies that 
overall constitutional law can be systematically violated. So in fact, this is the constitutional court is failing in their duties because the Constitution is pretty clear on this, that if there is a systematic violation, it's not protected by uh, relative autonomy. And so I hope that, it, I, I really hope it's challenging because the, this form of decentral, some form of decentralization was necessary, but to have this happen so quickly, uh, I think is a systematic violation of, of actually of the Constitution. Can I have a question? I, I will add on some, <coughs> some information. One day I went to Chianjur. Chianjur is a region, say, in western Jaffa. Uh, the region was telling me that there are fundamentalist group in, in Chianjur who wanted to implement Sharia for the Muslims in Chianjur. And then my colleague, who happens to be the region, invited all the leaders, all the Muslim leaders in that region, say, who wanted to have Sharia law. Then they said, I will give you a certain amount of money. I give you financial backup. Please now make a program how to implement Sharia law in taxation, in, I mean, in, in, in the local government affairs. Taxation and then uh, infrastructure development and then uh, the salary and horarium uh, system, something like that, you know. After three months, all the regions came to the region, said, sir, we hands off, we give up. It is very complicated. We cannot do it. So I believe that it is one thing to cry out about Sharia Islam to be the basis of a country, yeah? but it is another thing to have a systematic, concrete, down-to-earth program. Uh, I still remember when Professor Rahman, Fazul Rahman from Pakistan our great thinker from Pakistan, when, when he was in Karachi, uh, he challenged those people who believe that it is easy to make Sharia law being implemented. And then Fahir uh, Rahman told me that after they uh, worked very hard in making the full programs of Islamization of law, it turned out to be very difficult. So, so uh, what I like to say here is that for the Muslim in my country, like Muhammadiyah and, and you, Quran is not a book of law. Quran is a source of law. The problem with the Islamists and the radicalists, so to speak, is that Quran is is a book of law. You know, uh, but. but if it is a book of law, and then there are many, many missing uh, important things which is not, uh, I mean, it's not contained in Al Quran, you know. So, to me, as a Muslim, I believe that Quran is a book of law. It gives us moral guidance, moral and ethical principles, and then it's up to the Muslim people to exercise intellectually to solve the problems, but with the paradigm, with the ethical and moral paradigm of the Quran. You know. uh, I believe that uh, Achaf people, uh, by the end of the day, will realize that it is not uh, so easy, you know, uh, because even just uh, uh, the uh, uh, become a national brouhaha, uh, national uh, turmoil in my country. Well,
my answer is that the judiciary in my country is not independent yet. Uh, that's why there is an article which I read across the other day. In terms of freedom of the press, Indonesia is much, much, much freer than Singapore. Indonesian media lash out the corruptors day and night without stop, you know. They expose the people who happen to be huge and gigantic corruptors. You know. But the education, education of corruption in my country has come to almost nil. You know. In Singapore, there is no freedom of the press, but the judiciary is independent. You know. That's why the clean government, good government in Singapore is achievable exactly not because of the free mass media, but because of the free and independent judiciary. So this is, I think, what happened in my country. Sometimes we are very proud. Look, in South Asia, Indonesian media is Thank the most free. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, can you say something judiciary uh, about the is threat the of terrorism dependent. in Indonesia today and about the government's response to terrorism uh, in the context of the development of Indonesian democracy? Yeah, Indonesia is the biggest Muslim country, and then uh, Indonesia is also struck by three bombings in Bali, in Jakarta, and other places. You know. So that terrorism is also there. You know. But fortunately, I can tell you that in the last two years, we have been very successful in combating terrorism. Especially Dr. Azhari was uh, arrested, uh, well, I mean, was was shot uh, in, 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 in Bandung. And then another leader of the gang of terrorists, uh, Nurdin Top, is not top anymore, you know, because he has just run away. I think he is hiding somewhere in Malaysia. And then uh, I can tell you that last year, Indonesian people can celebrate the Christmas, the Islamic holidays, and the last year without any threat of terrorism. So in this regard, I believe that that our police and our, uh, our legal apparatus has been very successful in eradicating the terrorist uh, pockets. You know. uh, but sometimes we are very proud with our police because three weeks after the Bali bombing, all the perpetrators could be arrested. Uh, and then jokingly, we could say that our police is uh, a bit better than American police, because up to now, Osama bin Laden is still nowhere, I, we don't know. And then last night, I watched the CNN talk show that uh, Prison Bush has made a mistake because he did not focus on Osama bin Laden. And then all the energy were focused on Iraq right now. So Osama bin Laden has become Osama bin Furukotan. Like right? <laughs> the invasion of Sharia black measures in Bahrain, which is just outside of Jakarta, and the draft criminal code in the invasion of the Jakarta League community, which contains several new provisions regarding the dealing with um, public morality, things that would criminalize, for instance, following these arguments because of the needs of new women. As I told you, the, the, the Indonesian government does not uh, uh, make Sharia as our law, you know. So it's only in Ajay. Uh, Sharia law uh, is, is, is implemented or maybe is being processed, so to speak, you know. So I, 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 I mean, there is no, no need, you know, uh, to... to to be concerned with, with, with the possibility of Indonesia become a Sharia state. You know? 
uh, especially when I become five year chairman of the MPR, I know exactly the political balance uh, in Indonesia. Uh, only 12 to 13 percent of the uh, Indonesian people who belong to the United Development Party and Crescent Party who are still believe in, in Sharia as the God-given law to be uh, implemented in, 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 in our country. That's why I mentioned too, in, in Indonesia. So, this is my, my answer. The is always say that women in Islam is always oppressed, the inequality and so on. But in fact, Indonesia has the largest Muslim country and has a woman as a president. And in fact, in the U.S. for more than 20 to century, independence has not ever had any uh, woman as even candidate now. So what do what you, what you comment about that? Is it better democracy in Indonesia? I, I will answer your question by citing the Quranic verse, which becomes the foundation of the equality of gender in, 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 in Islam. That's me. While you're looking for it, I'll say that his mother was a preacher. Uh, and with, she's a religious preacher, which is interesting. And uh, maybe you'd know more, but it's uh, what what percentage of while well, he's finding the, the quote, what percentage of the of the preachers are in Indonesia are are women? And you spent a year in Cairo, and what percentage of the women in Cairo are what percentage of preachers in Cairo are women? It is difficult, I think, to, to know the exact number yeah. because there is no priesthood in Islam, right? So everybody is basically required by Islam to to to, to, to teach uh, one or two Quranic verses to their family members, uh, to their friends. But if we talk about percentage, I believe I mean percentage women in the world of preachers or yeah. to the whole community. Yeah, yeah. Just some estimate. Maybe one, 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 one of every 200. Yeah. One of every 200? Oh, yeah. That person is only 20% was yeah. obviously wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but must be. Uh, in my biography book, yeah. uh, I wrote uh, hand, hand, handwritten you know, the Quranic verse we said I, I, I can memorize by heart. Inna muslimina wal muslimat wal mu'minina wal mu'minat wal qanitina wal qanitat wal sadiqina wal sadiqat wal sabirina wal sabirat wal khashina wal khashiat wal mutasaddiqina wal musaddiqat wal sa'imina wal sa'imat wal hafidina wal khurjina wal hafidat wal dakina wal qatina wal takirat it means the very lay for all men and women who have surrendered themselves unto God and believing men and believing women and all truly devout men and truly devout women and all men and women who are true to their word and all men and women who are patient in adversity and all men and women who humble themselves before God, and all men and women who give in charity, and all self-denying men and self-denying women of fasting, and all men and women who are mindful of their chastity, and all men and women who remember God unceasingly, for all of them has God ready forgiveness of sins and mighty reward. So, to me, as a Muslim, there is no difference whatsoever between men and women. So you are right that Muslim countries are 
pioneers in having women as prime ministers or president. Turkey had Mrs. Samwadeh visited from Harvard to become prime minister, and then Bangladesh twice uh, had women prime ministers. Uh, Pakistan once uh, also prime minister, and then the biggest country in Indonesia has Megawati, my competitor, become president. You know. Uh, <laughs> Well, in the United States, uh, it will become a political breakthrough if Hillary Clinton become president. But I bet that... You were speaking about the corporatocracy. I mean, I, mean, I can bet you with Canada. And it's incredibly powerful entity. Are there tools, or what tools are you looking at for the Indonesian people to wrest some of those resources back for their own use, both Internationally and domestically. What I have in mind is that Indonesia needs to talk straightforward to those big corporations which have mining activities in our country. I mean, there are about two dozens of them. I think we have to convince them that we don't want nationalization of their, uh, their, 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 their industries, you know. But what we have what we want to see is they are our partners, equal partners. Indonesia is like a chicken which lays golden egg. You know. So let's share the golden egg together. You know. The problem is that Indonesia sells the chicken to the big corporation. So we have only ecological destruction, we have pollution, and we have nothing. You know. So. So, uh, I was inspired by Evo Morales, for example. Yeah. But to some extent, also, uh, those things tied in America, Latin American countries now who want to, I mean, to, to, to have a kind of economic nationalism. You know. But, of course, I'm very well aware that it is just unthinkable for Indonesia to be isolated from the process of globalization. But the problem is that we have to stand on our own feet, and then we are entitled to enjoy our own resources. Just for example, in the gold mining in Papua, Freeport McMoran, the, the, the royalty we get is only about, at the most, 9% of the total production of, 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 of the uh, 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 Freeport McMurrin. And also in Indonesia, sometimes it is misleading to, 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 to read at the glance the production sharing. Uh, as far as I know, usually for the oil uh, mining, Indonesia gets 85% and the external corporation only 15%. But the problem, ma'am, that that the operatorship is given fully to the big corporation, and then the big corporation will mark up crazy and unbelievably. You know. uh, so when it is time to divide the the, the, the end product, we have only maybe forty percent, sixty percent, probably will be taken by the corporation. So so. Uh, I think it is possible if my government uh, stand on its own feet with confidence, with uh, sticking to the rules of the game. Uh, we don't want to be left out in the cold because we know that we thought the investors from outside, we can do much, you know. Uh, the problem is that, that we, can, we can see what has been achieved by Kuwait, by Qatar, even Saudi Arabia, I think 
they can have a lot of of profit, uh, and at least uh, the production sharing makes sense, you know. But in my country, it doesn't make sense at all. We chatted about this a bit uh, longer yesterday, and one of the points you made then, which was uh, you didn't have time to make now, but was important, was uh, I mean, Rice is upset by the fact that in the 100% operation clause that they often have, it means it's a 0% learning curve uh, for the Indonesians because they're kept totally out of it. And this is something, by the way, that the Latin Americans really finally, uh, the people don't pay att much attention to dependency theory and so on, but th they were good on, th on that, and those uh, co-learning co and, and really cl very clear examination of which parts of it uh, you're going to be involved. Talk about the need uh, for the county reform right. and how the county is it is a very different thing. Yes. control over the natural resources. But Indonesia today has become a, an oil net importer. So um, they import more than they export, but yet remain an OPEC member. And I was wondering, what's your view on that? Why do they an OPEC member? It only costs them money. And then um, two, why are they still I think this is a very interesting question. Even our Minister of Oil cannot explain to the Parliament how big is our dairy production? Whether we are not importer or we are still exporter, it is not clear at all. You know? This is why one of my friends, who happened to be the parliament member, uh, asked the Minister of Energy to commit suicide. Uh, he said, hey, Mr. Pornam Yuskiantoro, you have been Minister of Energy for more than six years, but you do know anything about uh, the production and about how you come to the present price of oil for our own nation, you know. So uh, what I understood and understand is that Indonesia has become a net importer, but at the same time, uh, there are many information sources which said, no, we are still exporting our, our oil. You know? uh, so I don't know exactly who is right and who is wrong, uh, but even if we become net importer, I believe that it is only a small fraction of our consumption. It, it, is, it is amazing. But, but regarding the big corporation, I like to, 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 to give you uh, an example. You know. Just imagine that Enron could commit complete scandal in the state. You know. America is very famous with transparency, with rule of law. But in Iran, practically, commit all scandalous things imaginable. Insider training, fraudulent accounting, bank fraud, and then money laundering, etc., etc. Not just imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if a huge corporation like Enron or its likes could do such negative and destructive thing, they can do more in a in country like Indonesia, which doesn't have rule of law and which does which does have transparency. You know. That's why I, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I keep telling again and again and again without uh, being, uh, I mean, I mean, without boring, you know. Uh, that for a mission future, I think it is a good time to renegotiate the contracts in mining industries, mineral, gas, and other uh, mining products, you know, uh, because we thought the renegotiation uh, it will be damaging to the interest of the nation. programs, remedy some of the things that you're uh, bemoaning, like Lack of independent judiciary are going to put forward reform programs for the next and coming elections. This is what you could comment on that.
the central part of Muhammadiyah didn't have such think tank. But fortunately, Muhammadiyah has at least six big universities. And then in each university, we have uh, our and center. So this kind of things uh, are also discussed in the uh, center. Uh, but the problem is that uh, recommendation will still be recommendation if the government doesn't follow up, you know. Uh, and then if the government has become deaf and blind, of course, uh, all your input will be just uh, forgotten. But, but yes, indeed, Indonesia and Muhammadiyah has some good R&D centers in the universities. And you were one of the leaders. Uh, taking into consideration two factors, one being how easy it is to, to misuse the uh, religious uh, faith and, and sentiments to turn such things into, into violent uh, movements. And second, the fact that most of the times the government who is the, the subject of the opposition normally benefits from that uh, movement becoming violent rather than being peaceful. Uh, my question is. I actually wanted you to elaborate more, more on that and tell us how you managed to keep that movement, the nature, the nature, the peaceful nature of the movement, uh, and if you can give us some examples of, of certain points that you felt that it's that the violence is going to uh, to start, but you, you managed to stop it. <coughs> Let, let me tell you that that the huge and the bulk majority of Indonesian Muslims are moderate people. They don't buy any violence. They don't believe in uh, any violence to pursue the goal. You know. But it is a fact of life. And sociologically, it is understandable that in every religion there are little groups uh, which happen to be fundamentalists or radicalists or extremists. You know. And this I call fundamentalist pockets usually are very vocal and very, I mean they speak out. You know. Sometimes we will be misled as if they represent uh, a big number of the Indonesian Muslims, you know. But I can assure you that these small pockets are always small, you know. The problem is they, they can make a big echo uh, because they, 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 they uh, are very, very focal, you know. Now, the problem, how can we handle this so-called militant or extremist groups. You know. Sometimes we are successful, sometimes we are not. You know. But as far as I know, the leaders of those militant Muslims who does, do not believe in Pancasila and who do not believe anybody, you know, usually do not even, are not even able to recite Quran. You know. I, I, I know a lot of them when I ask them, could, could you read Quran? No. So how come you pretend to be Islam leaders, Islam leaders, while you you cannot re read the source of the Islam? You know. And then he said uh, to me, it is to us, it is not not it, it is not uh, uh, important, uh, but uh, to to us. Uh, Justice is the most important. I don't care about uh, the opinion of the people, something like that. You know. So, uh, in overcoming these problems, sometimes we are very successful, but sometimes we cannot even anticipate. You know. For example, what happened in Poso in the last two weeks uh, was beyond our expectation. Suddenly, there are... Uh, a group of Muslims who challenge uh, the government, and then the police are for also very reckless because they just shoot uh, some of them, you know, and then it will create uh, political uh, 
uh, problem in, in Indonesia. So, so I believe that uh, the best thing to overcome this uh, militant pockets, I think by uh, deliberation, by inviting them to, 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 to talk about their concerns, something like that, you know. But on top of that, I believe that they do what they do because of the social economic context, you know. I believe a poor community is like a dry grass, you know. If you put a little fire on the dry grass, suddenly all the dry grass will burn into a huge fire. You know? So, so uh, I noticed that those uh, rebellious groups always stem from the poor area in our country. You cannot see uh, this rebellious Muslim group stem from, relatively speaking, prosperous region or prosperous uh, places, you know. Most of them come to the poverty-stricken uh, uh, environment. You know. so, so I think this is uh, also a problem in our country, but I believe that uh, this will not become a serious problem in the future. I think one, another thing is somewhat less than it was in the beginning. Uh, I'm a specialist on military organizations, and I'm absolutely convinced, you don't have to say anything about this, uh, that in the, certainly in the first two years, part of the military were not reconciled to democracy, and they were actually complicitous on four or five very well-documented cases in what were really outrageous slaughters. Uh, they involved in, in weapons, they let people pass by, who they knew were going into a con uh, conflict, or uh, gave weapons. And that all of that is happening much less now. I mean, I'm not saying it's finished, uh, but remember, this is a military you don't control the purse strings of, and was uh, in power for over 30 years. And, uh, and they had this ideology of two functions, domestic security and, and, uh, and external security. And they're losing one of those functions, uh, because it's uh, it's a democracy. Uh, the military is self-financed. They, they are reconciling what themselves their names to it, where but the money comes more from? now than uh, <laughs> six years ago. Yes? Uh, if the military is self-financed, could you explain what that means, where does the money come from? They've always had this double function. Do you want to explain that or should I? <laughs> 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 uh, it's, they had a double function of domestic security and they were regionalized. And so Guy Parker, 50 years ago, wrote about this, and it already existed then. So to reverse something that's that deeply embedded, they run, uh, they have, maybe with a mining company, they may provide all the security. Uh, and, and the mine is, so it's 100% foreign owned in an area that, and that they provide all the security, or they provide some of the exports, or they have a whole series of industries. And so it's the most, at the it started, this democratization process started in a context of a long-term military role that had been the most high, highly self-financed in the world. And now they're gaining on it, and th but these things are hard. In Chile, uh, it's taken, we were chatting about this yesterday. The Chilean military in the 1981 Constitution of Pinochet installed in it that a certain percentage of copper prices would go to provide for national security, and that this could not be changed uh, except by constitutional amendment, and then Pinochet also put in nine senators, so it's a block one third. So you couldn't, you, you never had the voting capacity for the first 30 years or 20 years of democracy to possibly change that. Uh, it's changed, it's being changed now, but I'm saying that that was, that was something that we all knew about and we're all looking at, and it took 20 years. And we don't, we know much less about this, but we know it exists. And we know it's existed for more than 50 years. And uh, so it's a, a deep process. And, and uh, there's, there's actually been better, more progress on it than I would have From becoming violent against the government and inviting a backlash from the government, how are you able to keep the movement largely peaceful to be successful? I, 
Amin Muhammadiyah, the leaders and the, the mass are quite moderate. They don't believe in violence. And even Muhammadiyah was older than Elisha itself. You know. uh, Muhammadiyah was established in 1912, so Muhammadiyah is older 33 years than our republic. You know. Uh, so Muhammadiyah experienced uh, a lot of uh, change of the governments, a lot of different situations, the colonial, the revolutionary, the uh, period of old order, new order, and now the era of reforms. You know. So so far Muhammadiyah is so good. You know. I mean, there is no part of Muhammadiyah which is... Uh, which says it can be tracked into violence, you know. So, so Muhammadiyah doesn't have any problem whatsoever. You know. But, of course, Muhammadiyah and, and you uh, are always working together to contain, uh, who knows, some young people from uh, usually exact departments uh, uh, who, 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 I mean, who, who are too creative, you know. Uh, so that they challenge the government and the, and 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 and, and the state Marxist, you know. But but uh, overall, uh, as I told you, the mission uh, Muslims are quite moderate, you know. And then the compass, I mean the 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 moderating uh, uh, moderating of course, of course, Muhammad and Andrew. Uh, because Madendu represent, I think, 90% of the Muslims in, in my country. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess you got the gender factor here. Um, but, I mean, I was very curious about your um, comment that the radical is a very small but vocal group in Indonesia, the radical uh, uh, Islamists versus the, the moderate mainstream. And there's obviously been a lot of debate uh, among these two groups. And one of the things that's striking is that when many of the moderate Muslim figures try to uh, counter the Islamic challenge, or the radical challenge, I should say, they use Panchasila to do it, uh, it seems to me, rather than challenging, having a debate about Islam itself. Um, and I'm curious as to why that might be the case. Why when we see uh, the head of the current head of Muhammadiyah and who, you know, uh, countering this radical Islamist, is they, they appeal to Panchasila rather than debating tenets of Islam. Is there a fear of this, or how would one interpret that? <coughs> I don't think so, man, because uh, if you watch television or listen to the radios, uh, there are always debates uh, between the mainstream Islam and the fundamentalist one. You know. uh, maybe sometime this mainstream Islam refer to Pancasila just to remind uh, they counterpass that we have already Panzasila. It is uh, final. It is irrevocable. Where you always talk about Sharia, for example. You know. So, so uh, I think we are not afraid in debating uh, them with, uh, I mean, with confronting the Islamic, uh, the Quranic process, the Protestant tradition, and and Indonesian units like Kopassus. I don't know exactly, but for sure, the top brass of Indonesian military uh, were educated at this point. So, we don't send our army uh, officers to Russia or to Czechoslovakia. We send them to, to, to your country. You know. So if there is a close connection between Kopassus and uh, military circles in this country, it's quite understandable. Uh, 
uh, but we were relieved last year when uh, the embargo of uh, military equipment has been lifted up by, by Washington. Well, um, there are many more questions. I'm sorry for those of you both who have been standing uh, and those who I didn't have a chance to answer their questions or your, give you an opportunity for your second question. Uh, but I want to thank our guest who helped inaugurate this series, Miguel Rice. Uh, I mean Rice. Uh, and it was marvelous. And we have a reception uh, right out in the main hall right now. Thank you very much. Thank you.